Hello everyone. Let me extend a warm welcome to all our viewers who have joined us for another edition of Mukhomukhi. There is something very remarkably different about this program. Let me explain why. The individual who had been one of the nodal persons and also instrumental in coordinating and moderating this conversation based program for almost 15 years is the invited speaker today. No prize for guessing. I extend a warm welcome to Dr. Joydeep Biswas to our program today. I look forward to this interactive session. Uh, sir, who had been actually asking questions, seeking responses, will be taking questions today. Here I would also like to mention that the, our conversation today would be primarily focusing on Dr. Biswas's journey as a cancer warrior and he will be talking, telling us about his uh, fight against cancer and also about his negotiations with different kinds of odds, different kinds of challenges on an everyday basis. Let me start with an anecdotal note. It was 12th August 2017, if I remember correctly. I had come across this Facebook post of Sir, where he had announced that he has been diagnosed with cancer. It was very, very unsettling and unnerving for me. So when I went back home, I had WhatsApped him, asking him about his health status, etc. And his response was quite prompt. He told me that he will be undergoing the first phase of treatment and coming back home soon. There was so much of calm and peace about his response. It was so reassuring. He was the one who was perhaps consoling me. Uh, I would like to ask, sir, how, did, how have you been able to gather so much of courage, this measure of resilience, all throughout till now? It has been seven years, almost, yeah. yes. Uh, thank you, Shuranjana, for the nice introduction. And yes, uh, it's a complete role reversal today, uh, seat switching, you can say. So I'll now, today in this program, I'll get the taste of being at the receiving end. <laughs> uh, coming back to your question, yeah, I also remember the date, 12th of August, uh, 2017, because I had my first cycle of chemo on the day in Tata Medical Center in Kolkata. Thereafter, I had to take total of, a total of 43 cycles of chemo till 2020. Yes, I was very prompt in replying to you because there is a prehistory to that also. Uh, the point at which I was di diagnosed with advanced stage, stage four lung cancer, adenocarcinoma lung, that was in July and August beginning in Tata Medical Center. And my doctor, to a question from my wife, uh, he said flatly that you have just six months of life left on this earth. My only son, 13 year old, he was then, he was in the room. My wife burst into tears. Uh, I just saw the face of my 13 year old son. He was in class seven or eight then. Just two drops of tears rolled down his eyes. And quickly what he did, he touched his mother and actually helped her out of the room because before that the doctor was yelling almost that uh, you can be or I have to say so many, so, so, so many more harsh words uh, which you can take. So just be off the room. Within a second I discovered that my 13 year old son has just matured uh, just in seconds. And when the doctor was saying that uh, six months is the maximum time, I just shot back. I don't know where from I got that courage. I just shot back and I told, her, told him, the doctor, you start the treatment. I'll decide my uh, date of death. He was like, you know, uh, all eyes open kind of thing. And he looked at me. He said, oh, that confident. I'm like, yes, doctor. So there is absolutely no explanation about that, Suranjana, because I'm a very normal model, just like anyone else. I'm scared of so many things, right? I'm scared of 
dogs, I am scared of malaria, I am scared of high prices in the market. So just any other middle class, uh, I, I mean I have got absolutely no speciality, no brevet out, nothing like that. But that was the trigger point actually. And I thought that, I mean you understand, no, you, you can't think in that strategic manner right from that moment. It's not that right. I didn't cry, I cried also, there are moments of my crying as well. But uh, gradually I, I got a realization that there is absolutely no point in giving in. So my fight started from that point that don't give up. The text that I sent to you as you were saying that it was so full of peace and reassurance. Uh, that kind of text, plenty of text I had to do. Normally what happens Shuranjana, when someone is diagnosed with cancer and that too deadly cancer like lung cancer in the stage 4 stage, uh, the, the first thing that happens that the guy uh, just uh, you know gets into a shell, hmm. all right, it's all over for him, the world is finished. Right? So there's absolutely no glimmer of hope at the end of any tunnel and the family also does the same thing. More often than not, what happens actually, uh, the entire family uh, gets into a you know shell. They cut communications with the outer world. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they do it like that. And over these last seven years, I have met a number of cancer patients. And uh, because every time someone has got cancer in my town or even in the in the in, in the Varag Valley, uh, people get to get in touch with me because they think that talking to me will uh, you know, bring about a positive change. So I know a lot of cases. And one thing I'm telling you, Sharanjana, uh, I have come across people who had this lung cancer uh, when I, I mean, almost at the same time when I got infected. There are people who had lung cancer diagnosed later uh, to, the, to my date. Today, no one is alive. I'm the only one who is just alive on the day. And I strongly believe that I will remain alive. That's so nice to know. And the same kind of reassurance which I experienced in 2017 as I was talking to you. Uh, talking about uh, the subject of fear as you have talked about it, people just give in, they surrender themselves to this fear. Along with uh, the subject of fear, there is also this from a very social perspective, there are a lot of taboos right. about this disease uh, and uh, I was reading this uh, beautiful book by uh, a critically acclaimed thinker Susan Sontag uh, where she mentions in uh, illness as metaphor, you know how different stereotypes are being constructed around concerning this disease and also the subject of fear. Uh, would you like to reflect on this? Uh, Actually, my journey for the last seven years is the journey against fear. The only thing that I always tell uh, the people who have got cancer, the families particularly, and the viewers today who were watching this show, I, I would ask you that, see, cancer is a deadly disease. There is no doubt about that. And uh, it is also true that there is a high mortality rate for the cancer patients. In my case, uh, the statistics say that it is just 14% for, for someone with my variety of cancer and, and who can survive at least at most five years. These are statistics, that's true. I still remember Dr. Ravi Kandan and I was not uh, that close to him during the time. Mm -hmm. So after I was diagnosed and I uh, got into the first uh, cycle of uh, chemotherapy, then a friend of mine, uh, a noted journalist, he got Dr. Kandan on the phone line to speak to me. <coughs> Dr. Kanan was saying, I still, I said the, the words are very clear still in my mind and my memory. He was saying, look uh, Vishas, it's true that 14% is the global rate for survival in the variety of cancer that you have. And the survival also is a five year survival. But you have got certain things positive for you. Because you are young, I was 47 then, mm -hmm. you were young. Number two, you were non-alcoholic. Number three, you were uh, you were non-diabetic, and most importantly, you have got a positive frame of mind. If these four things are there, even if one person survives, that will be you. Mm. And I really thought that yes, 
statistics what happens we always go by the majority we always go by the bigger numbers why don't you go by the smaller numbers if 14 people uh, survive then why not me All right so from the from the first uh, you know from the day one actually my fight was against the fear and the fear that comes from within actually the fear that comes from within and of course it's a fearful thing i'm not saying that i mean you know uh, the, uh, the there is no fear fear element in it but there is a difference between fear and phobia right so whenever you have the cancer uh, anyone see don't ever think that oh how can it happen to me why me a lot of people asked me after i was diagnosed sir why have you had that cancer you are so you are so good a human being why should cancer afflict you now you understand no this is not a this can't be a reasonable question uh, cancer if you go by the data both global data indian data northeast data everyone will find that cancer rates are going high right you if you make an inquiry uh, among the people you know you will find that at least one cancer case you will find in any extended family of anyone you go about uh, you know making random sampling uh, of say 100 people i bet you will find in 100 to 100 cases you will find a cancer patient who is in the extended family so cancer is not a rarity anymore all right moreover the problem is that that often it is said that cancer uh, mainly comes from the lifestyle say in my case it could be a lifestyle because as a smoker right uh, but not that uh, all such cases are related to the lifestyle right sonali vendre for example you were saying so exactly. there's, there's no lifestyle issues attached to the cancers so cancers may be genetic may be familial may be so many I mean, reasons are uh, quite plenty so whatever be the reason if you have cancer is first thing is that you go to the doctor right mm -hmm. because the early detection early diagnosis always increases the chance of survival medical science has made a made a very significant improvement over the years so the treatments are nowadays more targeted more specific histopathological tests this laboratory this technologies have improved a lot because cancer treatment uh, can be best when the doctors get to know the tumor uh, more accurately, more intimately. So, whenever someone uh, gets it, I mean, heaven forbid, but then it doesn't matter whether I wish or I don't. So, the first thing you have to do without spending even an hour extra, you go to a doctor, I mean, an oncologist, and follow the protocol that is given by. This is the first thing, because you have to deal with it. The fear factor that you were saying, this is the deal with it. Coming to the tab taboo, yes, I have seen, you know, highly educated people, quite cultured uh, families. For whatever reason, I don't know, they even don't tell that their family members have got cancer. I mean, what is the point of social stigmatization? And, you know, and even, uh, uh, you know, cancer is not contagious. Cancer is not infectious. So, if I have got cancer, you can get in touch with me, then even not having it, right? So, it's not, it's not Corona, it's not COVID. But surprisingly, in our society, I still find that those taboos, those stereotypes mm. you were talking about, those metaphors yes. you were talking about, these are there. Yes, because as you say, it is not COVID, but that there seems to be more than a, the issue of contagion. Because yeah. during the pandemic, people were declaring that they have got COVID-19 and right. recovering, recovery stories or stories otherwise also. They were floating around. But when it comes to cancer, because I also have a personal connection because, because my father being a doctor, people would come and seek advice. And I have seen that in the, in the vicinity of the neighborhood or in the locality also, people, there would be a very hush-hush thing about yeah. being diagnosed. So, all this along with fear, there is also this idea of stigma or this idea of taboo and also this issue of morality, if you could, you know, about somebody being diagnosed with cancer, you know, there is a kind of a constant dynamics between the issue of morality is somehow it is being attached to that person's identity. So, would you like to respond to this, sir? Yeah, cancer is now a part of my identity, I can deny that nor I would like to deny that. Hmm. Uh, identity is a matter of personal choice, uh, you know. 
after reading Amartya Sen's famous book. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, we can't help it. I have got a social visibility in any case. Uh, at the same time, I am very vocal about my cancer. Mm -hmm. From the day one, as I said, literally from the day one, the point I came to know that I had it. I wrote on my uh, Facebook timeline, Ei korecho bhalo, uh, from Tagore. Because I accepted that. The first thing is acceptance. Never, never ever think that uh, you can't be a cancer patient. Everyone is a potential cancer patient. Just think that way. Whenever it happens, you have to deal. It's a matter of dealing with the things, right? So, uh, and if you can do it, see, seven years now. And let me tell my story in a, in a bit more details. Mm -hmm. It's not the one, one stroke thing. I got the cancer diagnosed in uh, July and August uh, uh, 2017. After that, I was put on chemotherapy for long, I mean, indefinite cycles, actually. After completing 43 cycles in the month of June 2020, just follow the uh, timeline. June 2020, the world was reeling under COVID. All hospitals were out of bound for the patients. And my doctor was in Kolkata. I was here in Shilchar. And I had the disease revisiting me, and this time with renewed vigor. It was in uh, it was in uh, lungs. Now it was in liver as well. Okay. So I contacted my doctor and uh, over the uh, you know, through email, and he is a nice gentleman really. I mean, he has been the commander of the uh, entire fight for me. He wrote, "Okay, relax. Now your uh, chemotherapy is not working." Don't worry, I'll be put on some oral medication. It's a very costly one. Anyway, I had to go for it. So since 2020, July actually, I have been on oral medication till today. But even after that, last January, this mm -hmm. 2024 January, I was in the routine checkup in Kolkata. And there the doctors found that now it has spread to my brain. Okay, metastasis again. And now there are only two options. One is a very costly medicine which I can't bear. And uh, second one is radiation. As far as possible, it should be avoided, the doctor said. But then uh, since I can't afford that price in medicine, so I had to go for radiation. In April, I went for that, 10 rounds of radiation. So I took here in Kachar Cancer Hospital. And then I, in June, I went back to Kolkata for an assessment. Uh, okay, it's under control. Because my variety is that I'll never completely recover. I'll never be a survivor. I can at best be a warrior. Doesn't matter much that. Because I live for a day. Uh, you are uh, a professor of English literature. You uh, must be knowing, uh, you know, uh, Carver, Raymond Carver, a very famous American 20th century poet and uh, story writer. Now, Carver died in 1988 at the age of 50. And he had his cancer, just the lung cancer, the same variety that I had, in just 10 years ago. So, 1988 means 1978. His doctor also told him that he will li live for just six months. All right. There is uncanny resemblance. Mm. And he went on to live for another decade. And finally, he uh, you know, passed away. Uh, in the month of August, I think 3rd or 4th of August, 1988. After his death, his last piece of poetry was published in New Yorker. The name of the piece of poetry is Gravy. A very interesting uh, thing he wanted to say in his last piece of creation. He said, save this story. He was saying, save this story. No other word will do for that's what it was, gravy. Now, what is gravy? Gravy has got a normal, I mean, very common uh, meaning as we all know, mm. the thick sauce, right? But gravy has a second meaning also. And he was using that word in the second meaning. In the second meaning, gravy means the add-on, the extra, the top-up, 
Okay. Uh -huh. So he was saying that I was I was in for dying ten years ago. Why are you wailing now? Every day since then was a gravy for me. Just imagine. What an evocative poetry. What an evoc and 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 I found a reference to that. I mean, I knew that piece of poetry. I I I knew uh, you know uh, Raymond Carver, particularly for his cathedral, uh, but. Uh, recently, I came across this reference in uh, Salman Rushdie's knife. Exactly. Rushdie, you know, uh, he was uh, uh, there was a life attempt on him in August 2023. 20, right. He was sure to die actually, Absolutely. but thanks to the splendid medical intervention of the West and his determination to not to die, that he came al came back alive. And after that, he wrote a book. The name yes. is Knife. Right. All right. It got published maybe two months back ago. So I got very interested, and quickly I got ha got uh, got a hand on the book, and I read it. And he was saying, uh, he was also referring to this point. He was saying, "See, what do you do after you get a second shot at life?" The did the create the major question. What do you do when you get a second shot at life? Every day should be a celebration. And really, Shuranjana, for me. Every additional day is a celebration because my life is now a life on lease. Every three months, I go to the doctor for assessment in Kolkata, and without knowing what exactly is going to be the outcome of the tests and all. So basically, these three months is a life for me, and I enjoy every life of every day of that. I remember I was awarded a Brave Warrior, uh, you know, with a Brave. Uh, Warrior Award by an US based NGO who is working mm -hmm. on that uh, breast cancer hub. Uh, a lady, a spectacular lady from this town, Dr. Lopa Mudra, uh, she is the founder of that. And so, on the, in the program, when after the award was given, uh, given away to me, and in my acceptance speech, I said that never knew that mere Survival on the earth for a day could be so rewarding. I am being I am being awarded this award today for what actually? For being alive for another day, and that is possible, Shuranjana. That is possible because, but then you need your people around, and I am so lucky about that. He is taking a cue from what you just now mentioned, from people around. I have known your family for long, yeah. especially your better half, uh, Shumita Didi. Uh, she was my school senior, right. and I have seen her holding the fort, seen her supporting you, uh, giving her your her giving uh, your you her companionship when you needed the most, and but she does it very quietly and right. silently. Right, a very remarkable woman, I must say. And also the rest of the family, the family members, your sister, your son, and your extended family members. Uh, would you like to say something about that, sir? Definitely, my helped? journey. I mean, the story is incomplete without reference to that. Uh, uh, definitely, my wife is the you know general of the journey. No doubt, no doubt about that. And as you have rightly pointed out, that she has been she has been the caregiver for me. But she does it in such a such a professional manner, because what happens actually when you become caregiver, uh, that's fine. I mean, wife is a caregiver for the husband, not a new thing, maybe, but a big thing also, maybe, in our social structure. But uh, more often than not, you'll find that the wife is, uh, you know, always considering the husband, the afflicted one, to be a patient. That's the thing. In my family, cancer has never entered. We never discuss this. Believe me, my wife, my son, my my sister, my niece, we never discuss cancer. Cancer never, you know, crossed the threshold of my door. I mean, truly, I'm saying. As a result, every day is a normal day for us. Whatever I mean, it, when, when the things happen, as, as I was telling you, this is the second time that cancer has got back to me. Maybe after three months, I may have a new problem. It may happen, but whenever it happens, we just deal with that. And this is exactly the message that I want to 
you know spread out basically that take it easy just never consider yourself to be a cancer patient all the time and the family members also shouldn't consider the patient to be a patient all the time too much of care too much of food right from the beginning to the end i mean it it creates what it always reminds you that you are a cancer patient so that's not that because you have to lead the normal life i have taken 43 cycles of chemo two in uh, kolkata and the remaining 41 here in shilchar in kachar cancer hospital and believe me i haven't taken a single day cl in the college i used to take it in the morning got back home had my lunch and all and rushed to college because i thought that that was the only way that you can have your life normal you are setting examples actually i don't know really i do it in my own way talking <laughs> about that uh, you have a very significant social presence just now as you said that you had not taken a single day cl that's exemplary uh, talking about your social presence and also your role as a teacher uh, of, uh, as a political analyst you are often invited to political show, uh, talk shows and panel discussions so this is already an identity that you carry within yourself additionally there is also this other, another identity of being a cancer warrior so does it feel burdening that this identity has been somehow glued to you uh, uh, would you like to respond to that sir uh, very good question uh, yes i have got two identities obviously the first one is correct that i am very socially visible and uh, i love my talking so and i talk a little too much and uh, whenever i get the chance to talk i go there so i am visible of course uh, on the social media as well yes that's true my profession my job also uh, makes me visible to a considerable extent and now as a result of that visibility obviously and since i am very vocal about uh, my cancer i mean i constantly update on the social media my status of health mm -hmm. after every uh, you know assessment in kolkata Uh, I shared the bulletin with the people because I know that lot lot of people are there who are actually anxiously waiting for me what to happen. So uh, as a result, uh, definitely these two identities uh, they come face to face in a way, right? And one identity may try to take over the other, mm -hmm. but I don't think it. I don't take it that way. Uh, for me, actually, it's a kind of complementary thing right now mm -hmm. because there is no denying the fact that I'm a cancer patient, but in spite of that what i am just the things to look at all right so uh, i don't mind actually that he, that he is, is there is no denying the fact i know i know that my cancer has uh, created a new kind of identity around me but i enjoy that i'm proud of that actually you keep giving regular updates about yeah, your yes you know it very well yes i keep giving regular updates because i want to show the i want to tell the world that look look at me i am not a survivor someone was someone was right uh, writing in my uh, in the in the comment thread that sir you will recover <laughs> i said no i will not recover but i have to cover a lot of ground so it's a see shuranjana in all wars you don't win absolutely you don't get the victory but the struggle is important the struggle must go on right so this is a kind of a struggle and frankly speaking i don't feel that i am in the struggle things have bec become so easy for me thanks to my family thanks to the pe thanks to people around me i mean i i never knew had i not been uh, you know afflicted with cancer i would have never come to know that so many people love me the way they do so this is a this is a kind of new life for me so the basic question there is a gravy every day i have the gravy and i told you shorhanjana i'm repeating also that uh, i live for a day doesn't matter but fully thank you so much sir for sharing your time your experience uh, giving us so many insights into this your journey as a cancer warrior i don't think a conversation like this would elicit any kind of closure and i don't intend to do that uh, joydeep sir always says that he resists actually Uh, being designated as a uh, as a motivational speaker or an influencer and true there is no dearth of social media in influencers all around us 
but Sartre's uh, presence actually goes much beyond that. He defies all these defining parameters. And I think uh, this is enough and that should be enough. Thank you.